Hey everybody, this is Eric Lopez, also known as Blue Beetle and the Scarab. And you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello team, welcome to Scream Something, Volume 5. My name is Rich and I am here with my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in Scream Something, Rich and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 3 that were released last Tuesday. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but we'll be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the season finale. You've been scanning us? (laughs) Smart. Trust no one. Certainly not Earthlings. Sir, we sent you the evidence. Earth metahumans are being kidnapped off-planet for use by apocalyptic forces. The metas are mind-controlled into violent action. We've seen it. Then perhaps we should send a hawk fleet to quarantine Earth's populace, since the task is clearly too difficult for certain officers and their human sidekicks. Don't call us sidekicks. With all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles of this week's episodes are Influence, Leverage, and Illusion of Control. The release date for all three was July 2nd, 2019. The in-episode dates were November 3rd through November 22nd. The directors in order were Mel Zwire, Vinton Huke, and Christopher Berkeley. The writers for this week's episodes were Brandon Vietti, Thomas Pugsley, and Greg Weissman. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 14 opens with an off-world team of the Justice League investigating a possible metahuman trafficking lead on Thanagar. Back on Earth, at the ruins of Mount Justice, Nightwing, Superboy, and Artemis offer Brion, Terra, Halo, and Forger the opportunity to join the team. On the news, Calder reveals the threat of the good goggles to the general public, Lex Luthor further incriminates the Justice League, and Gretchen Good admits that the goggles were dangerous, but blames it on Jakar Marlowe, the man murdered by Black Spider and Terra, back in Rescue Op. In Los Angeles, Gar stops a robbery and later travels to the Watchtower to announce that he is rejoining the team officially, alongside the former Outsiders, as well as Superboy and Artemis returning to the team, uh, to help specifically take down Gretchen Good. On Earth, Victor continues to refuse to join the team, the Harper Nguyen Kroc household continues to be in chaos, uh, Jace continues to be untrustworthy. I don't know. And that's, mm, we'll, we'll get see. to it. We'll talk about and Tara it. Records, <laughs> records a conversation uh, about Jace requesting her own fully functioning lab, fully stocked lab to help Victor, and sends it to Deathstroke. And back in space, the League follows a ship's ion trail back to an asteroid base known as the Orphanage, where they discover all the metahuman children that the light has successfully trafficked to Apocalypse, as well as a strange giant torture device thing that we don't know what exactly it does but hurts superman uh but before they can save anyone they're jettisoned into space and have to watch as desaad granny goodness and the furies escape in the orphanage via an enormous (laughs) boom tube that even gets guy to stop talking (laughs) for once for once (sighs) trash fire we'll talk about the trash man we'll talk about guy (laughs) Episode 15 starts with a look at how Granny Goodness is making Gar's life on set extremely difficult uh, before he heads to the Watchtower, where he's assigned to a stealth mission team investigating a government-sponsored meta program in Russia, which is outside the League's jurisdiction, so the team has to go in. Meanwhile, in Taos, Dr. Eduardo Dorado Sr. and his son Ed, who we saw back in Season 2, are leading orientation at the new Metahuman Youth Center. Later, the team arrives in Russia and discovers mecha-armored volunteers working to become a team of government-sponsored heroes. We'll get into that. Uh, However, 
As they attempt to leave after gathering some information, the team encounters Captain Boomerang, Black Manta, and Monsieur Mala, who should all be in Bell Rev right now, and a fight breaks out, as it does. The villains attempt to retreat, but a quick threat from Amanda Waller via comms sends them back into the fray against both the team and the Russians' Rocket Red Brigade. While the brigade successfully beats both the heroes and the villains, Artemis is able to talk her way out of an international incident, and the team heads back to the U.S. to deliver all three villains back to Belrev. Over in Taos, Ed's trying his best to train and counsel some new metateens, but one of them, a girl named Wendy, loses control of her powers and almost kills Livewire and Mist. It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> At Bell Rev, Calder learns that Amanda Waller is running a government-sanctioned covert team of criminals known as Task Force X, a.k.a. the Suicide Squad. Yep. To round out the episode, we see Wendy the Metatine put on an inhibitor collar. Helga Jace uh, gets her own lab and starts doing who knows what with that hairbrush. It's fine. And we get the revelation that Gabrielle Dow, the former quote-unquote owner of Halo's current body, uh, accepted a bribe to let in the assassins that murdered Brion's parents. Yeah. And with that, on to episode 16, where it's time for a Thanksgiving episode. Yay! Yay! We've got a Harper, Nguyen, Croc extended family dinner gearing up in Star City, a Friendsgiving celebration in the works in Happy Harbor, and even a harvest festival in Taos. And while everybody else is being cute and festive, Jace is in her lab being creepy and suspicious. In Taos, Perdita and Garfield (laughs) arrive at the harvest festival for... Sort of team building day, sort of triple date plus Virgil thing, apparently, a.k.a. Seventh Wheel. In Star City, Jace arrives at Thanksgiving and in Happy Harbor, Forager tries to convince Vic to come to dinner, an offer which he refuses. At the Harvest Festival, we get a little subplot about how Ed still feels bad about Wendy from last episode and wants to do more for the Metateens and offer them hope. A sentiment Gar absolutely agrees with, but in the middle of an inspirational speech, everyone at the fair is incapacitated, and Perdita is kidnapped by Count Vertigo. The team heads off into the desert in pursuit. Back in Star City, Jace mentions that Artemis has been doing good work with the team, and Artemis's mom loses it because she didn't know that she was back on the team. Uh, And they have a very heated conversation uh, between her and Artemis about how she should leave the superhero life behind and apparently date Will, her brother-in-law. Yeah, we we all have thoughts on that. (laughs) We'll get into that. Back in Taos, Tracy eventually grounds Count Vertigo's helicopter, but the team keeps getting lost in the Pueblo because of illusions conjured up um, by Count Vertigo, even though he doesn't have illusion powers. They eventually realize they're actually up against Simon and Devastation, and that kidnapping Perdita was just a distraction for Queen Bee's task force to kidnap the other Metateens at the Harvest Festival. At Thanksgiving in Star City, Halo's guilt gets the best of her, and she admits to Jace that Gabrielle let, let in the assassins that killed Brion and Tara's parents. Jace promises not to tell anyone, but then calls a mysterious someone to ask for help. Classic Emily, hashtag suspicious lady scientist, hashtag. In Happy Harbor, Vic eventually joins the Super Martian household for Friendsgiving. And back in Taos, the team returns to the festival just in time to stop Onslaught and save the other superpowered kids. And when the news media arrives on the scene, Beast Boy, Blue Beetle, and Kid Flash decide to go public with their superheroics in an attempt to inspire other meta kids. And I have Crashing the Mode thoughts on that. Uh, we'll get into it. We both did a lot of screaming in these episodes. <laughs> so much screaming, and we posted about it on Twitter. So yep. let's feel this aster. Dipper boy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. All right. I just, I want to apologize to future listeners. If my voice sounds awful, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I like seasonal allergies or something. I'm drinking a lot of tea. Hopefully it's not too distracting. <laughs> so let's get into our emotions about this episode, and I'll do my best to keep my voice in check. So I want to I, I want to talk about the opening scene in the very first episode. Go for it. Because I'm already like, yeah, just that first everything, everything <laughs> in there. 
The Hawks get voices. Yay! <laughs> Technically, we've now seen Thanagar. Yay! Interesting bit of stuff. So, a little mini Secret Origins. Though it can't really be many with the Hawks because they're a mess. Their origins are a mess. Okay, so there's been multiple origins for the Hawks. We've talked about this a little bit in the show. The original Hawkman, his name was Carter Hall. He was an uh, archaeologist. He found this something in Egypt, you know, got these wings. Just whatever. He was human. He was an Earth guy. And then they revamped stuff. And so then the Hawks were uh, aliens from a planet planet called Thanagar where they were police officers and they got stranded on Earth. And that's the origin they kind of used, though it gets more complicated in Justice League Unlimited for Hawkwoman. The reason I brought all that up, really, is because in Justice League Unlimited, they kind of handle this. There's two different Hawkmen. There's Carter Hall and the cop, the space cop Hawkman, his name is Katar Hole, K-A-T-A-R-H-O-L. So in Just League Unlimited, they had both of those characters, sort of. So they had the Carter Hall, they'd already introduced him. He, there's this whole past life thing and reincarnation going on with Shara Hall and, and Carter. It's very complicated. But in, an, in a three episode kind of mini movie, called Starcrossed. We find out all kinds of stuff about about Shara Hall, aka Hawkwoman, and including that she had a fiance. Well, they didn't want to use Katar Hole because it was they'd already used Carter Hall. So they made an anagram of his name into Hro Talak. H-R-O-T-A-L-A-K. Well, Talak is the name of the guy they're reporting to in the opening scene of this episode. <laughs> he says like uh uh Cater Hole. I, 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 we don't know his secret identity at this point, but they're clearly from Thanagar says something like Commander Talek. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like, this was the guy from Justice League Unlimited, if I remember this correctly. Anyway, so I don't know what that complication is. Um, they mentioned Nth Metal, which is great, which I think is the first time they mentioned Nth Metal in Young Justice. Nth Metal is, the, is very common on Thanagar. But it is not common in the rest of the uni- uh, the rest of the galaxy, and it is a metal that has all kinds of unique qualities, including magical disruption qualities. It's what the weapons of a lot of the hawks are made out of. Batman actually uses nth metal uh, periodically when he's combating characters like Gentleman Ghost and characters that are incorporeal that he can't touch. Um, it also has healing properties, anti uh, anti gravity properties, which allows their wing uh, devices to work. Because in the comics, they don't actually have wings; they have wing devices. But in Justice League Unlimited, they had actual wings. I still don't know what the situation is with the wing situation here in Young Justice. So, just this first like scene was already had me reeling with the amount of information that was in it. And then there's Guy. Guy. He's a trash man. He is a garbage fire. And they do him really well as a garbage fire. If you guys, if you don't know who this guy is and you're watching this going like, who is this horrible human being? In the first season, when they were trying to decide who they were going to add to the Justice League to uh, widen out their ranks, there's a moment in which I believe it was Flash had said, hey, there's another Green Lantern. We can use the firepower. And <laughs> and both Hal and John said no <laughs> at the same time. Uh, they were talking, obviously, about Guy. So, apparently, you know, he's now a member of the League, or at least with them out in space for whatever reason. Yep. Yeah. So, just that I was screaming in that whole first episode. Yep. <laughs> There's all kind of politics going on, like Thanagar is still recovering from the fact that Hawkwoman was part of that attack force on Rimbor, and how it's... It's not that easy. It's not like in the comics where it's like, oh, we made this mistake. Oh, we were just mind controlled. Sorry. Oh, okay. Thanks for letting us know. And then like moving on, like that's not what's happening. They're still having a really hard time recovering from the situation from years before. Yeah. I knew from the minute the uh, little timestamp said Thanagar, I was like, oh, Rich is going to be excited. (laughs) Also, uh, on a related note, uh, during that absolutely awful song that guy is singing, he mentions Mogo. (laughs) Mogo... 
It talks about the about Oa, which is the home world of the of the lanterns. But then in the second line, he's talking about the rings of Mogo or something like that. I think he says. <laughs> okay, Mogo is a planet. Obviously, Mogo is a living sapient planet. Mogo is a member of the Green Lantern Corps. He, Mogo is a Green Lantern. <laughs> the planet <laughs> is a Green Lantern. <laughs> Emily is Emily's got her O comic books <laughs> face on right now. <laughs> Why are you like this? Does it does this planet just like like guard itself? No, like, it, what is it, it, in it moves of? around. Yeah, it flies around. Okay, but nothing nothing in the Green Lantern mythos will ever be my favorite thing that there is a Red Lantern who is just a cat. It's just a normal cat who's very yeah, angry. He's an angry cat. I think an angry cat from Earth. I don't think it's yes. an alien cat either. No, I think it's, it's a normal cat. cat. <laughs> uh, if you want to know more about Mogo, you can. There is actually, if you list, watch, there's a movie called uh, Green Lantern Emerald Knights. Uh, and that is a bunch of short stories about a bunch of different uh, Green Lanterns. And they actually have one of those uh, little, I think there's like five or six little short arcs. One of them is about Mogo and it's pretty great. Yeah, there you go. Again, all that in the first, like, whatever, pre and just post credits. <laughs> so speaking of Guy Gardner's terrible song, there were a couple of musical moments in these episodes that I really liked, because we've just been thinking about this more ever since you got to talk to the fantastic composers. But like, oh, we get right. more of the really cool, like, silent, space fights with like yeah. the epic music in the background which is so cool to hear uh yeah. there's also i like almost i got real emotional when artemis starts talking about wally and they have this like just tiny musical cue in the background that yeah. like sort of sounds like their theme from season two i wasn't completely sure and did not have time to go back and check but it's definitely a reminiscent of the musical cue that they wrote for them in season two and it broke my heart and yeah, yeah. I need to call it out because it hurt a lot of incredible music in just these three episodes and they've been posting about it a lot like uh christopher carter like had posted a bunch of stuff about these episodes and because they've already obviously they've already seen them all <laughs> so but i i mean i I think they're posting more about this second half of the season than they did when the first half of the season came out. Like, I, or maybe I'm noticing it more. I don't know, but they're pretty excited about what's coming up and, and the music that they got to compose for this. So I'm really excited to, to see what's coming up. In addition to all of that other, there's so much, again, stuff in the background. It's Young Justice. I nod to uh, my friend, uh, uh, artist Jacob Blackman, who pointed out to me <laughs> that... In the scene where uh, Gar gets the purse from the purse snatcher and turns into a gorilla, and then there's the selfies. The woman who takes the selfies' name is Angel O'Day. Uh, <laughs> Angel O'Day is from a comic called Angel and the Ape. <laughs> and uh, if I remember correctly, I think I talked a little bit about this in our comic commentary where they had all the apes. I think that was the one where I talked about it because a gorilla city gorilla goes to, I believe it's Gotham they're based in and ends up becoming a police, de not a police detective. He ends up becoming a detective, a private detective with Angelo day. And it's a detective com series of comics is what's going on there. And it's pictures of Angelo day with Gar as a gorilla. I, I'm just like, Really? Because why ever label anyone as girl with selfie stick when you could pull a character <laughs> out of the archives and just because decide that it's them? Never ending characters to pull from. Uh and I didn't I didn't notice it. Her name is in the credits, uh, but it's also buried on the you know, whatever Instagram feed or whatever she's using as well. But it clearly says Angelo Day on it. The app that she's using is actually the one that they mentioned in the tie in comics in the Young Justice Outsiders prequel. Oh, that's right. Comics. That's right. I knew I'd heard that before. What's the, it called again? What 1K Wordsworth or something like that? Oh, we talked about that in the comics, actually. Yes. Yeah. We're, worth a, a thousand pun. words. It's a pun on worth a thousand words, which I didn't get. 
I didn't catch that. I was like, I don't know what's what got to mean for? something. And you were like, maybe this obvious pun. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, maybe. Oh, OK, fine. I got that. So I, I saw this conversation. Uh, Zeno Robinson was watching Young Justice and he was live tweeting about it. And one of the writers from Craig of the Creek that he works with had posted as well because I can't remember which one said it first, but one of them was like, wait, why is Superman worried about breathing in space? Can't he breathe in space? That's like a thing, right? <laughs> and I was like, well, first of all, shouldn't be. It's ridiculous. But also... Um, <laughs> In earlier episodes and seasons of Young Justice, they've, they've, I mean, directly Clayface had said, even Kryptonians have to breathe. There's the scene in uh, Failsafe where they are up in space and they're facing down this, the, the spaceship that's attacking Earth. And you see Superman's got an oxygen mask on. And early on in this episode, they actually have um, gear on these belts, um, these Kirby Tech looking belts that they were wearing. <laughs> to give them this force field that protects them when they're in space as well. So I'm really excited about this. It was a simple thing that made me so happy. It bothers me that I'm like, I get, okay. Some people are like, well, he's basically photosynthetic. He can survive in space because the yellow sun helps his metabolism and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, I mean, sure. All right. Doesn't explain how many times I've seen people write him talking underwater and stuff, it just, it bugs me to no end. And we were so even talking can about do like... whatever the plot needs him to do. I know, and I get that. And that's the way he, <laughs> no, he was until like the dumb. 80s, right? And so if you're going to have some consistency here, let's let's do some consistency here. Like, you know, I don't know. So anyway, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. And I'm really glad that they did that. Because I mean, even the, in, in the comics, even the Hawks... They need to breathe, but they can survive in raw space in the comics. And I'm like, well, maybe for a little while. Like, the human body can even survive a little while. But still, I don't know. It always just makes me think of the thing from season one where the red androids are trying to drown Kid Flash and Superboy. And Superboy just shouts, uh, you can't drown a Kryptonian. We don't need air. Because he's just trying to think of something to distract them. And I'm like... Boy, yeah. you lion. Yes, exactly. Yeah. He'd already yeah. almost drowned in the tie-in comics at that point, actually. Yeah. And we talked about that, I think, in our even in our um our masks game too. I think uh <laughs> I think Ishin was like, Yeah, it's pretty much the only place I can really die. So <laughs> um I'm like, Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um. yeah. Uh yeah, I thought that was pretty awesome. Um Barda being saved by Superman, wow. That was beautiful because at first I was saying like, okay, this Barda looks pretty angry. This is a pretty angry Barda. This is not Barda ready to leave Apocalypse yet. Um, I wonder if we're going to get into that. <laughs> and then Superman, and then after this woman who claims to love her, you know, disciplines yeah. her. And then Superman literally saves her life after that same woman. Just, I don't know. Uh, there's something that switches in Barda's mentality so that when Scott Free you know, is trying to escape and they send the Furies after him. She helps him escape and then they end up obviously getting married and things like that, which is a Mr. Miracle storyline. I don't know if we're going to get any of that, but still it was pretty, pretty cool that they dropped all that in. I hope so. I think she looks cool. I'd like her to be a cool hero lady. Absolutely. We just got a message from one of our listeners actually too, um, which I thought was really cool. Uh, I'll get the name here. They were talking about how in the original comics, Barda's uniform, she was supposed to be like a, a lieutenant in the military or something. And so they kind of revamped her uniform and Granny Goodness's uniform to look a little bit more on a similar vein. Like there, like there's a military rank going on, which is kind of cool uh, on the design front. Also, the fact that the they brought this up in the email, which was something that I noted that was pretty cool is... Granny Goodness takes care of takes care of quote unquote all of the you know these orphans that exist on Apocalypse and the asteroid that she uses as her home base is called the orphanage. Here it's got a whole different connotation, um, yeah. which I think is really really interesting as well. It's like same consistency but applied to a different idea. Let's see, this was from Andy W. And they said in the comics, Granny Goodness is in charge of the orphanage, turning children into soldiers. So her asteroid base is called the orphanage. Barda's classic outfit is an officer's uniform. So whilst making Granny a superior officer in the show, they've updated her outfit to include elements 
of the officer uniform and Darkseid's Omega symbol, which I think was really, really cool. Also, they need, they note that the Furies, when they attack, they're using those same flying discs that if you read the comics, you'll see that Scott Free and some uh, other other characters use as well, which is really cool. So thanks, Andy, for, for writing us and, and letting us know. Gosh, what else was going on? <laughs> Bart saying 52 takes. <laughs> I 52s like, and there was 16 million followers of that of that uh, 50 million likes or 16 16 million likes of that photo and then also the next episode was 52 million likes so we got the 16s and the 52s yeah were when he had the, when they did the 16 takes joke my immediate thought was I was like it would be real funny if they took that to 52 takes and then they have <laughs> him walk in and I was like I uh, I got it I predicted the joke Nice. Well done. Because there's only two numbers on Young Justice. That's right. Uh, somebody else was posting too. They were like, what is that? That 16 thing was like a lot of 16s. What's that 16 about? And then uh, on Twitter and somebody else was like, let me point you at the Young Justice files and they will explain <laughs> the 16, which was funny. The Rocket Red Project, I didn't see that coming either. Uh, makes I don't know sense. what it is. Uh, Rocket Red was uh, Dimitri, the the guy who steps into the suit without taking the without being knocked unconscious first. Yeah, uh, he's actually Rocket Red. God, when did he come into the seventies, eighties? Let me take a look. Uh, he came. He was actually a member of the Justice League. Actually, um, I think he was created in the eighties. Let me see what I've got here. Uh, eighty seven. Dimitri Pushkin was uh, July nineteen eighty seven. Looks like he first appeared in the Green Lantern Corps and then uh, appeared in the Justice League. And there were three, I want to say, Rocket Reds, maybe four uh, Rocket Reds uh, that had been a member, members of the Justice League. In fact, I remember seeing him. There was the episode, I think it was called The Return in Justice League Unlimited, where the android Amazo uh, had gone into space, learned a bunch of stuff, and then came back to Earth and was confronting Lex Luthor. But as he was coming back to Earth, I think Rocket Red was in space, maybe, or maybe he was on the ground, like he was part of the Justice League defending the Earth from the returning android. So established character for 30 years now in the Justice League that no one's ever heard of. So that was pretty exciting. I think it's interesting that you mentioned that there have been four that have been part of the Justice League. Because what I noticed with the Rocket Red Brigade that I kept thinking about is they only show us two of them. The numbers on their suits, though, are one, one and, and four. four. So yeah. there's at least two that. other people out there with giant mech armor. I'm interested to see what happens with that. I don't know. So that was pretty cool. Um, Task Force X. One of the things I really liked in the scene where <laughs> scene where everybody's going, the Justice League as a covert ops unit and Mala turns like a uh, black man is like, yes. And Mala turns around to everybody and goes, Oh, and he like nods his head and groans. And I'm just like, Mala's head is beret handed to him so many times by this covert ops team. And the eye, the look in his face, he's just like, yes, <laughs> there's definitely an ops team. <laughs> That's really, really, really funny to me. I, I agree. Uh, screamed out loud. With the hair, we were right about the stupid hairbrush. I cannot <sighs> believe we were right about, we were right about stupid our hairbrush. Ridiculous theories. Ah, uh, we don't know what she's doing yet. Neil is firmly in the camp that <laughs> Dr. That, Jace mm-hmm. has done nothing wrong yet. And I'm like, hashtag, right, n- hashtag nothing but- wrong. Yeah. Uh, and Emily and I are like, Gah! And Neil's like, you know, yeah, technically, that. she still hasn't done anything. I'm just like, oh, she still could turn out to be a nice person. I don't know. And then we'll just feel bad. And then we'll just feel like terrible human beings and rewatch this with a whole different tone. I don't even know. I don't even know. She still sounded so manipulative. But she's like, I don't know. I'd love to help. I, if I only had a fully stocked laboratory. <laughs> And she's not really? doing anything to help Victor Stone, as far as we can really? see. Really? Yeah. She hasn't done. She hasn't done no. anything. But for we that. did. We did get to see hardware again, so that was good. Let's see if we can see hardware again after that. That would be really, really, really cool. So another thing I noticed that was, I, God, there's got to be so much stuff in the background. Please let us know what it is. All the things that you find. <laughs> the voice actor for both Henchy and uh, Count Vertigo is Steve Bloom. If if you follow animation at all, you know Steve Bloom. He's literally everywhere. 
but he happens to also do the voice of a character on Rebels named Zeb, Zeb Zebarelios, who's one of the aliens there. And Zeb's like curse exclamation in Star Wars universe is Carabast. <laughs> And there's a moment where where Steve Bloom as a Henchy picks up uh, Queen Perdita and says Carabast girl and then walks out of the scene. And I was like, did they put that in there? Did they just let him do that, or did they put that in there on purpose? Because Greg also worked on the first season of Rebels as well, which I think is really funny. I agree. Um, I didn't notice it. You had to point it out to me. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the bribery scene, the whole thing, revealing the bribery. We kind of saw that come in sort of like we were wondering back and forth. But then she has to tell Jace. Jace is the person she tells. Anyone else would have been a better option. And Jace's reaction, completely blunt affect. Zero shock, like no empathy I don't even know what to say. Like, her reaction is still, like, it's like this intellectual response. This intellectual, like, you know, like, support instead of, like, oh, that must be terrible. And who did she call? And it, ah. I don't know. And then she said, yeah, I know. It's been a while. And she, it was so casual. I'm, like, I don't think that's, she's not calling, like, Deathstroke and the League of Shadows. Like, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see. And it's only one episode a week now. So for the next seven weeks. Let's see. What else did I want to talk about? Oh, the the seventh wheel thing. Let's 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 talk about let's talk about that. We both have some some thoughts on that. And I think we have very similar thoughts on that. And then we'll transition into some of the stuff that you have as well. OK, I got I got a lot, but we'll start there. Yeah. Well, I mean, somebody had pointed out to us about the seventh wheel comment. And I was like, oh, and OK, so. Bart and Ed could be dating. Gotcha. And then I went back and rewatched it and I'm like, I'm getting no signals for that. Like, I get it and I think it would be great, but there's zero. They just call it, they call each other friends and Bart gets him, well, doesn't end up getting him some cotton candy, you know, that kind of thing. But I mean, did you notice anything? Did you see anything? Because I was like, I'd like something a little bit more definitive than just that. So, <laughs> uh, this was something that like hadn't, even crossed my mind until a couple of people were talking about it on Twitter and were kind of directing it at us. And just in general, it was just around. And on my second viewing, when I was taking notes, I was like, okay, let me, let me look at this and see. And I agree with you. Like there is an implication in Virgil's dialogue. And in the fact that like the two of them are paired off for stuff Right, well, yeah, like they're in the bumper cars isn't. together and that kind of thing. Yeah, and like there's the little thing of people were pointing out the the visual parallels between the fact that uh, Jaime has his arm around Tracy for like the entire episode, and near the beginning when all of everybody shows up, Bart hugs everybody and then goes back to standing by Ed and has his arm over his shoulders. And I'm like, I get that. I get where you're coming from. I could see that maybe. But, like, the fact that they're going back and forth calling each other friend, I was like, that that's not really okay. It's distance. Sure. It's kind of distancing. It's, yeah. Yeah. There was also, people were pointing out when people were talking about this, Greg Weissman did at one point retweet somebody's tweet saying, like, oh, these two characters looked like a couple. And Greg just kind of casually retweeted that. Uh, and people are like, is this a confirmation? Is this, what is this? Uh, and so I don't, I don't want to assume anything because like if they're together, I would appreciate more concrete confirmation that yeah. they're together than a casual retweet and a vague joke about being a seventh wheel. But at the same time, I am willing to like, be patient and see where this goes. Cause like the first time we saw Tracy, there was no indication that she was Jaime's girlfriend really other than they were hanging out right. together, but they were also hanging out with Bart at the same time. So I'm like, I'm willing to have some patience and see where this goes. I'm not going to accept it yeah. as canon immediately, but I could see it happening and I think it would be, would be cute and fun. Yeah. I, I, so I agree with you. I think, if you yeah, I think if you're going to go for the if you're going to go for the seventh wheel joke that happened through the whole episode with Virgil, which was genuinely funny and I thought was genuinely it, it's funny. It's really it's but... really funny, but like I 
I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I would, I yeah, a holding, a scene, a holding hands when they're walking away. Uh, it's as simple uh, as that. I don't know, really. a something, a, some other, some other, like a, a nickname that they use together that they don't use with someone else. Yep. You know, like, hey, this is my boyfriend. You know, kiss on the cheek. Like, has Ed ever met Queen Perdita before? Like, we got. I, I don't know. There were there were things that I would have liked to have seen that have been. I agree with you. More more concrete. They're kind of they're dating in my head. Like I like you were saying. Like you're <laughs> not going to take it as canon, but they are in my head now. So like I would like to see more of that and just let it be what it is. Just let it be what it is. And on that parallel note, uh, we have non-binary Halo. Yes. We have non-binary hair low. I wow! I mangled that sentence, but I'm excited. I <laughs> you're so excited. I know. You mangled the sentence. I did. I when I first watched the episode, when they got to that moment, and Halo had her little her little speech about that, I genuinely teared up because I I am I am cis. I am not like part of that community, but I was like, this is gonna matter to somebody, and the fact that I see this so rarely on TV. I'm like this is gonna matter. I'm not sure I've ever seen it on TV. I can't think of a character that has identified even in this way as non-binary. Yeah, like yeah. And they continue to call her she later on, but I mean, she never did say you know specify what her pronouns were, and she may go by she they or something as she as she figures something out. I'm gonna keep yeah. calling her she because they keep calling her she, um, and she seems to respond to that. That's what I've been going with, that Halo is non-binary, but uses she, her pronouns, which is totally right. chill. I will throw out, I know we we had talked about it a bit, and I don't know if if there has been any discourse online about this. I haven't gone searching. But like we talked briefly about like the idea that I would like there to be more non-binary representation that isn't aliens or androids. But right. that being said, this is still good and important in my mind. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, because it also came up. We had somebody email us, email us or messages. I can't, I can't remember where we got this message from. I'm so sorry for who that was. Um, talking about how Forager may well be non-binary as well, because that whole their whole culture has they they don't they're very complicated about pronouns, and I can't. I have to go back and rewatch see if anybody even refers to Forager as he. They just refer to refer to Forager as Forager. Uh, but again, that would be two kind of alien or alien origined characters who are non-binary. So, but you, I, I agree with you. When you said that to me, it's like, it, this is going to matter to somebody. And I think it is going to matter to somebody. And I think it is yeah. important. And I think it's, uh, there, there are other things that I would like to see as well. Just having it be as it is, you know. With Forager, uh, I, if I'm remembering correctly, when they explain the thing about pronouns, McGann says his race has a very complex sense of self. So the fact that she calls him him while understanding like everything that's surrounding how the bugs from New Genesis use language makes me think that he probably identifies as he. He just doesn't use pronouns. But mm. that's me making assumptions and extrapolating information. Yeah. I don't know. It gets complicated, and let's, I mean, we, we have we have such a uh, again such an ensemble cast, and of course they give when they give uh, Forager the the charm, the 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 character seems to be you know male, yeah, like male appearing. I guess I don't know how to put that. So I don't know. So there's more going on, but I mean, there's they spent time real time with Halo explaining. I don't know what I am. I don't know what I am in relation to that. And I'm not sure what I'm comfortable yet, but I'll let you know, you know. <laughs> and the thing I really liked about that speech was when she started that speech with the first like, yeah, more girls. I thought it was going to lead to like a thing or be in reference to like the idea that Halo is like insecure in her relationship with Brion and being like, oh, Brion is going to be around more girls in this community and what does that mean and oh i didn't even it, catch that oh i see like what you're that saying. was where my mind initially went because they'd mentioned because they because they had earlier had the parallel of like brion when she was going off to school when halo was going to school for the first time brion being like oh boys 
And I was like, are we going to do that same thing, but reversed? And then, no, it's so much better. And it is about Halo yeah. and like her identity. And it made me really happy. But yeah, I loved that. I loved a lot in these episodes. There's so much happening in these first three episodes. There's a bunch of little things I loved. <laughs> I love that Superman uses team slang. <laughs> yeah, that was like, cute. He's like the only member of the league that we've seen do that. And it just, to me, implies that he spends time with Connor and is involved in his life and has just picked up this stuff by accident. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. It's real cute. Uh, I also, similar vein, love Beast Boy calling out Calder on the fact that no, none of the team's missions are ever just recon. Uh-huh. They always go off the rails and Calder's just like, no, <laughs> not uh-huh. today. You know what? I, I was listening to that and I was going like, was that a nod to us? <laughs> was that a nod, was a that nod, that a nod to, to the everyone. podcast about how many times we talk about how their covert ops missions are always a disaster? We didn't start that, Rich. People I know have, we didn't. I know. <laughs> there is <laughs> there is a very old thing from like back in the days with the fandom where somebody had just made like a gif set that started with Batman saying this is a stealth mission recon only and then was just followed by a gif of every time they've just blown up a location <laughs> no I, I I get it this is a thing from the comics from back in the 60s <laughs> like this is a thing that's been talked about forever I'm just saying we talk about it a lot <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do. I also love the idea of Black Canary and Miss Martian both being like meta teen psychiatrists, therapists, whatever their exact job title is. Yeah. Because uh, I know those things are different. <laughs> um, but I love it. B- uh, Brave and the Bold Therapy Edition. Uh, I'm here for that team up. Right, totally. <laughs> <laughs> And just, it's cool. It shows how big the world is. I like that we kind of, like, I feel like this is official confirmation that this is what Black Canary's job is. (laughs) I want to just take it as like, yes, no, this is Black Canary's actual job. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm at at that point too, where I'm saying like, no, she's not a florist like the (laughs) guys. She's an actual, she's like a therapist. Yeah, I'm happier with, I mean, no, I mean, florist is great. But like, hey, no, don't throw no shade at florists. I'm not. There's zero shade. <laughs> I love florists. I really do. Um, <laughs> and maybe they feel underrepresented and maybe I shouldn't say things. But uh, it makes sense for this particular version of Black Canary, I think. I completely agree. I also speaking of team ups, I really I really like that Livewire and Mist are like friends. Right. Like they're not. They're like I like that they're portraying this not as just like here's two people who happen to be on the same villain team. It's like no, they have a relationship and they have a dynamic. And Livewire is like actually really intensely worried and protective when Wendy's powers go off the rail, to the point that like I ki- I kind of sort of could see them as a couple. I don't know. We'll see. I just I think it would be cute. I want villain girls being a couple. That would be fun. Uh <laughs> But yeah, I thought I thought it was interesting and in showing how like Livewire's response to Mist being hurt, not great. Don't electrocute other random teenagers. But like I liked that little scene and the implication that they they are friends and they have a close relationship. I liked it. I agree with you. <laughs> All right. What else do we got? We got we talked about that Halo revelation. I, I have a note here. <laughs> like, I don't know what more there is to say about that Halo revelation. It's just there and it's a lot and we'll see where it goes. <sighs> I Talk wish she had told Artemis. Like... I wish she had told Artemis oh, instead yeah. of Jace. Artemis would have had something actually productive and sincere to say rather than just, it's fine, I won't tell anyone. That's not, that's not good. That's not a good approach. Yeah. <sighs> But I also yeah. have a note here that simply says, Forager is a precious child and I love him. Um, and I'm not <laughs> sure exactly what that was in reference to, but it still stands. Um, Forager is precious. I think, I, think, I think what it was was just the beginning of the Thanksgiving episode where he was so excited to have like put cranberry sauce on a plate. I was like, 
this precious boy. <laughs> and then the episode just fasc- continued of being fascinated like, by things. Yeah. <laughs> and he just cares so much about his friends and wants everybody to be okay. And I love him. Yes. Yes, he does. I He's love precious. It. Uh, also speaking of characters that I just love unconditionally, I love Queen Perdita with every fiber of my being. Uh, <laughs> Queen Perdita She's is awesome. wonderful. The, just everything. Her showing up in the Thanksgiving episode. She's here. She's not flaunting the fact that she's royalty. She makes jokes about it. She actually fights back when she's kidnapped. <laughs> like that shouldn't be so rare, but it is. She thinks she's just oh, fighting yeah. Count Vertigo. It's revealed to be a super-powered Simon, and she just punches him in the face. I'm like, I am I am here for this. I am here for the fact that she reaches out to other people. She kicks him in a sensitive spot first, by the way. <laughs> yes, when she thinks it's Count Vertigo, which is just hilarious uh, and great. It is very hilarious. The girl doesn't have super strength. The girl is just like, what can I do? Nope. What can I do in this you situation? This. Um, yes, there are a number of sensitive spots. That's one of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you also like the fact that she's so good with people and like her reaching out to Wendy and trying to be like, oh, let me see if I can help here. And even like her talking yeah. with Ed and just being like, no, no, I'm not. I'm not a queen. I'm just I'm just me today. I'm just yeah. me. And she even busts out with the Spanish, which I thought was really, really yeah. Cool. I'm like, does Queen Perdita speak fluent Spanish? Because I would believe it and I would love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the, what I was thinking of uh, a minute ago, why I almost interrupted you, was um, as soon as that scene started and everybody started getting sick and like dropping to the ground, I was like, "Ooh, was there something in the? Was there something in the cotton candy?" And then like so Vertigo I showed think. up, and I and I was like. Vertigo's doing this? Huh. I was like, they changed the animation? Really? Because they, they didn't show his like Aquaman-y rings that he normally shows, right? From the first season, whenever he's doing the Vertigo things. And I was like, that's... I didn't even think of that's that. A, that's a weird miss for <laughs> Young Justice. Something's going on, right? And then, you know... Of course, we find out there is something else going on at first, but yeah. But I think what's uh, something uh, that I, I, I'm, I'm afraid you weren't going to mention was the fact that how Perdita was able to get a shot in it, Simon, was because yeah. of his deep love of devastation and how distracted he was when it looked like she was going to get hurt. He couldn't maintain it. We're going to have a long pause while Emily recovers. <laughs> I'm just going to get up and walk away from the podcast. Like, I can't, like, like, I, every time it comes up, I am surprised. Like, of all the things that this show, like, I'm not mad about it. I am just continually confused. Like, I, like it's fine. They're fine. It's whatever. I'm not I'm not anti this ship. Every time it comes up, I'm always like I forget in between episodes that Young Justice committed to this. The Young Justice is like, "No, yes, this is a did. thing." And like like it wasn't just one throwaway joke in season 2 anymore. I'm like, "These two are in a committed relationship and I am just perpetually baffled by it (laughs) i get it is it is just gender swapped evil super martian and i get that but (laughs) i am i (sighs) the show is just bamboozling me at every corner with this (sighs) And you know what was it? Because I st- I didn't know it was Simon until he turned into Simon. But like the moment like Vertigo turned around and he was like, uh, "Be careful, my love," or whatever. I was like, "Is Vertigo and Henshi in a thing? Is that a thing now?" <laughs> right? And then they like I was like I was kind of like that's co- interesting. And then they switched, and I was like, "Oh, oh, okay, all right." Oh, now it makes sense. <laughs> I, I well, I the other made sense too, but I was like. Uh, I was like a whole like parallel universe just went off into my head right there yeah. for a minute. And I was pretty stoked. I was like, there's going to be fan fiction about that business right there. Yeah. 
Like, same. I was like, I'm I'm willing to run with this, I guess. Uh, okay. <laughs> right. I was like, oh, no, it's the other thing that I'm just willing to run with. Okay. But I did really appreciate Virgil walking in and just being like, how, how, how did this happen? And yet I, <laughs> oh, Virgil. Yeah. I mean, how many, hen- think about it. Think about it. Think about all your supervillains. Think about all their henchmen. How many henchmen really last eight years? Not many. I mean, groundwork is laid, if that's a thing that needs to happen. I'm just saying. Season five. I don't know. Anyway, you had some other stuff here about Leon. (laughs) I broke Emily again. I'm fine. Apparently, these three episodes were the episodes of all of the villain couples. Apparently. I don't know. <laughs> Super uh, sweethearts into the light? Is it we're gonna have to do that now? No. <laughs> None of them have had arcs. They just have moments. Uh, I'm just baffled. Uh uh let's talk about Leon. <laughs> before I go to Leon, I do want to say that I think it is very cute that both Gar and Perdita just have their moments of thinking that the other one is just fantastic. It's real cute. I like it. They're cute. They're the unexpected OTP yeah, sure. of the season. <laughs> but Leon, to move on to Leon, this precious child who is apparently voiced by by Zara. Uh, yes. Because <laughs> we finally got a voice for Leon and she's adorable. Uh, we Auntie get Mouse. The Thanksgiving. <laughs> she calls Artemis Auntie Mouse. I it's this can't. Cute. Bruce Lee's disgusting too. <laughs> She is wonderful, and I love her, and we need to protect her forever. Uh, and I, I have to, I have to say, uh, shout out dad moment too. Like being a dad, like it's hard, guys. Watching dads represented in you know popular culture is real painful and real hurtful. I hate, I hate almost all of it, uh, and it's difficult for me. And seeing Will do that, where he was like, "Grows out contest," and then they were just laughing together and sharing that moment and being having her be loved like that, I was like, "Thank you, thank you." Oh. That's good. It's real good. We also get Leon singing Artemis's mixed up nursery rhyme uh-huh. song from Miss with her mom, with the grandma. With her mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. so good. It's real cute. I was like, oh, look at that callback. That's a good callback. We also, like, half of my notes are just pointing out random facts that we learn in the Thanksgiving episode. Artemis is getting her master's degree in comparative literature. Sure, I'm here for it. It's like, (laughs) and it's actually mentioned in season two uh, that she's the class that her and Wally are in is Vietnamese lit. And I'm like, Awesome. Yeah. I love this is the through line. Apparently this is what Artemis decided to pursue in her life and I am here for it. <clears throat> okay, on a serious note though, not not a devastation Simon note. On a serious romantic arc note. Um you and I were talking about this Will Artemis her mom conversation thing and I was like yeah. and you you made some really I I think it's some really interesting points and I I want to get that on record. So let's I got some I got some thoughts on this Will and Artemis thing because a lot of <laughs> multiple people have tweeted at or near me being like, what are your Will and Artemis thoughts? And a lot of people have been upset and annoyed. So here are my Will and Artemis thoughts <laughs> that I sent to Rich and Neil in like wait. an essay. So now y'all get a mini super sweethearts. I don't ship it. Uh I don't want it, but I also think the show doesn't want me to want it let me explain i think the show i think young justice is presenting the idea of will and artemis as a bad option as an option of convenience rather than them actually having feelings for each other because it doesn't feel like they're secretly in love with each other or even that they're all that physically attracted to each other either like none of their interactions read as (laughs) any of that even the times that we see them looking at each other in these these two like last episodes half the time they're not even smiling they look wistful and sad and paula just extrapolates from that for some reason and especially when we've seen 
both of these characters in romantic relationships and thus have some idea of what they look and act like when they're attracted to someone. And especially when the show keeps going out of its way to remind us that Artemis is still actively grieving Wally, literally broke down trying to even talk about him in the simplest of terms, and that Will would salvage his relationship with Jade in a heartbeat if he was given the opportunity to do so. None of that reads to me as the show trying to tell me these two are secretly in love. So I think the idea of being together is one of those things that like keeps passing through both of their minds, especially since so many other characters keep insinuating that something's up between them. But I think both Will and Artemis keep thinking something along the lines of that the other person is good with Leon, they understand being in the superhero life, they're smart, they're kind, they're funny, they're caring, there's nothing wrong with you, so why don't I want to be in a relationship with you? Like, I feel like both of these characters, to me, are reading like, I wish I could make myself fall in love with you because it would be so easy to make this work, but it's not actually what either of them want. So basically, I don't think the show is actually trying to get us to ship it because I don't think Artemis and Will are in love with each other. I think they both wish they were because life would be so much easier that way. But that's not how falling in love works. (laughs) And that, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. This is what I'm here for. There are people, um, there are multiple people I saw posting about just i mean aside from all of that stuff that you just you just dropped just the just the idea of this conversation being had between her mother and yeah. her yelling at oh. her to 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 get together with her brother-in-law in front of the pictures of their family like because i mean everything about that was just like i understand her mom's worry and concern and like the practical practicalness of what she's trying to get across. And none of it is like emotionally or like, I don't know, psychosocially okay. Like, I don't know what to say. And to unpack some of that even more, I think it's like, I understand why Paula would say it, but I think it is very weird to have a character going this Leon needs a mother because it implies that Will isn't enough. And I'm like, that's... That's a whole other conversation I will have. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Because I'm like, Will is a fantastic father who is doing great and Artemis is helping out and he's fine. But you notice, actually... I get get it. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. The other thing that happens in that conversation is she says, oh, my daughter sets a beautiful table. I'm like, what the... What about Will? Will lives in that house. Will didn't what? I like Artemis. Don't get Artemis me started. I will get in your face about this. Yes, she does. Like, Thank goodness she pointed like, it I out. Had, and I was I just like, help. I had a lot of help. It's, uh, it's look, man, I was stay. I was stay at home dad too, and I, I, you know, like I worked on the weekends and stayed at home dad, and I, I had to deal with that prejudice all the time, and it just it drove me nuts, nuts. Yeah, the thing. I think it makes sense coming from Paula, though, simply because of the and, fact and, that she... And, yeah. I, and that's the thing. <laughs> Everything that she's doing makes sense. Like, one of the things that Greg yeah. said years ago it was, I, I don't want you I to have to like... <laughs> I know. I don't want you to have to like these characters. The characters don't need to be likable. They need to feel real. Right? And, yeah. I'm going to let you finish now. But I was Sorry. trying... <laughs> It's okay. We're screaming. Rich gets heat. Rich gets heated when dads dads are not appreciated on shows. But when dads I can are under, insulted I can regularly, <laughs> I and I can understand where Paula is coming from, simply because how absent she was from Artemis and Jade's life, and the fact that they were largely raised by their dad, and how that affected both of them and led to both of them, I think, having issues. Jade very clearly having issues with what it means to be a mom and what it means to be part of a family and Artemis having her own stuff revolving around that. So I understand where Paula is coming from of like, I don't want Leon 
to end up like that. And I get that. But the difference is, Will isn't Sportsmaster. Will is a good dad. (sighs) And the fact that all of this happens in front of the adorable family photo of Will and Jade and Leon is another reason I don't think the show is trying to get me to care about Artemis and Will in that way. Because half of that, I had to watch that conversation more than once because the first time I was so caught off guard by how adorable that photo is and how clearly it shows how much Jade cares about her daughter. And Will is just standing there with like giant puppy dog eyes looking at his assassin wife. I'm like, and you're trying to convince me that Will and his sister-in-law should be dating with that in the background? No, 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 you're not. You're narratively not trying to do that. Yeah, this all made perfect. It just, it all rang true when you were telling me all this. And I was like, okay, I'm feeling, I feel better about this now. But I also keep thinking about this friend of mine, this friend of mine on Twitter, who is just, (laughs) she's recently, she's been posting these things. She's been doing all of these incredibly cool things out in the world. Like she's, she's a game designer and a bunch of other stuff. And she literally would, you know, flew uh, to another country to like run role playing games in a castle. Like cool stuff. And she's posting pictures. She said she's she's posting tweets about conversations with her mom. Where she's like, Mom, look at this cool thing I'm doing. And she's like, I don't know what the picture was. She was like in front of some castle and like all this kind of stuff. And her mom was like, huh, why do you always have weird hair? You know, like that was that's her response. Like and, and it's like, but it, and you'd think that like one response would be kind of funny, but like there's a lot of these and I'm like reminded of of this conversation in this situation of just like parents being so like, I don't know, like I, I get the love of your child, the love that you want them to be, you know, practical and accepted and not all this kind of stuff and like have the support they need or whatever it happens to be. But man, come on. Come on, Paula. Come on. And it's one of those things where Young Justice has in the past had things where part of building up a relationship is having other characters point out that hey you two make a good couple but the difference between that is the difference between like robin or miss martian kind of casually and teasingly being like oh you two have good chemistry and having a character literally shout at someone else about how you need to stop doing what you want with your life and date your brother-in-law is (laughs) <laughs> is substantial. <laughs> There's a substantial difference between those two scenes. That invokes a mood right there. That's for sure. <laughs> Yay. Yay. And I appreciate the heck out of Artemis literally going, he's my brother-in-law. N- no. <laughs> like, yeah. Like Artemis is just like, but mom, stop. <laughs> Yikes. But. Other things do happen in that conversation outside of me and other people screaming about (laughs) the idea of Will and Artemis, that not only is Artemis getting her master's degree, she's planning on getting her doctorate, she's planning on being a college professor, like, all of this is wonderful, I love Artemis's life plan, Uh, (laughs) and, but then you have other stuff from this that... It just had me thinking way too hard because Paula mentions that Artemis spent the last two years recovering because going back to the team almost destroyed her. And those are the words she uses. And the way that they talk about it and the fact that Paula even brings up the fact that she is in a wheelchair and like connects that to Artemis's choices makes me be like, is this just the psychological impact of like grieving Wally's death. Is this something else? Did something else happen in the two year time skip? What, what's going on here? They even mentioned that Artemis knows about Barbara. <sighs> Maybe doesn't know that she's Oracle. Presumably. No, she would. No, she still, do- we still don't have confirmation if Artemis knows. We just know that she does know Barbara and that she got hurt being a superhero uh there's so much to unpack in this conversation i'm dying i have been thinking about this scene for the past four days 
and I can't even wrap my head around all of it. Yeah, so so does I, I'm assuming Paula doesn't know Barbara was Batgirl, but she knows that she has a friend named Barbara who's in a wheelchair. She might know that she was Batgirl. We don't know how much. I, I'm Paula saying knows about I the team. I don't know either, but I for some reason I feel like her. She, I for some reason I feel like Artemis would not be telling her mom every but you know people's secret identities, right? But, but I mean, I mean, worst case, worst case scenario or best case scenario. I don't know. One case scenario is that, you know, here's my friend, Barbara, you know, she also had an accident and it was in a wheelchair. So she, I mean, she knows that, but I, I like that this idea that maybe something happened over the two years. I, I felt like it was an emotional destroying, not a physical destroying, but then you said something and I was like, Oh, Oh. Maybe she did when she when she went Tigress at the end of season two. Maybe something. Maybe she did something not good. And the only reason that I think that is because she brought up both her and Barbara, and we know that Paula is in a wheelchair because of stuff that happened when she was being Tigress, yeah. which is why I was like, I feel like I don't know, but I feel like you wouldn't just bring up like you have another friend who is also in a wheelchair completely unrelated to these life choices you're making. Yeah, that's true. Like, to me, it felt like being like, look at me, look at Barbara. We have both gotten hurt permanently as a result of of choices in this life, in the life, different sides. No, that's a really good point. That's a very fair point. Yeah. And the fact that she brought it up to me felt like maybe at some point over the past two years, like the language was vague enough and ambiguous enough that I'm like, maybe Artemis did get hurt. We don't know what happened in the past two years. I could totally see her putting that tigress outfit on and then going out and like being borderline suicidal, like as in like putting herself in (laughs) real difficult situations and not caring as much as she would normally be caring. I can, I I can see that happening. Right. Yeah, interesting. Tie in comics. And along these whole lines, I do think it is very weird that Paula does bring up like, hey, you went back to the life and your boyfriend died. Date your brother-in-law. Like, why are all of these things in the same conversation, Paula? They really should Paula be. needs therapy too, for sure. And I get it, man. She was married to freaking sportsmaster. I get it for sure. There's a lot of trauma there. Uh, there's she's I, I suspect layers and layers of trauma going on with Paula, but she needs to get her own help for sure. Yikes. So last little last random little thing to unpack about this Will and Artemis thing, because it's just been bothering <laughs> so me all much week to and I will never be fully. D- <laughs> I will never be done unpacking this. I have been <laughs> like before I said anything to you or Neil, I had been thinking about it for hours like I had to like work through things before I had anything coherent to say about (laughs) these two I think it is also telling that the few times that we see Artemis like looking back at Will and like clearly thinking whatever thoughts she's thinking are when he's doing things that remind us of Wally Mm -hmm. when he is being being silly funny and silly and goofy or helping her in the kitchen because we know Wally cares about food. Uh, I'm like, the, <laughs> no, that was, <laughs> like, that no, a great, good, great point. <laughs> I didn't think about that. And you just have that. And I'm like, that to me doesn't feel like her being like, I am in love with Will for who Will is. It's like my redheaded brother-in-law kind of looks and occasionally acts like my dead boyfriend you know it's funny that when you said that like i was picturing the scene where she was looking at him and he was doing the dishes and like his back was to her so all she's seeing is this red-haired guy doing the dishes and probably flashing back oh my god my heart ah yep yep which is the same and we never we never get like any equivalent stuff from Will, except in that one moment when he kind of glances back over at her. And I'm just saying, I feel like there might be something with Will going on of like, she reminds him of Jade. They are sisters. They have a lot in common. You would think that there are even subconscious things that they do or say that, I mean, I, I, yeah, I was. Hi, Artemis calls, Artemis calls Leon baby girl. You know that thing her dad calls her? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I've been thinking so much about episode 16. There's too much. <laughs> what were you going to say? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, like, I mean, 
uh, maybe everybody runs into this. I don't know. But I was like, I was like just walking recently up to the office. And of course, we have these big double doors that are glass and they open up. It's like a hospitally like building. It's got a bunch of medical offices yeah. in it. And I wasn't paying attention. I was like, I was lost in my own thoughts. I'm walking toward the door. I'm kind of seeing myself almost out of the corner of my own eye and realizing that I walk exactly like my brother. I like, we have this, he has this, what I used to think was, a, was quite a unique way to walk. And as I've gotten older and I'm not 145 pounds anymore, my body has shifted in a way that I walk exactly like him and it's kind of creepy and weird. So I'm just thinking like, like I told my brother that and he's like, yeah, I want my walk back. Stop doing that. Um, <laughs> but I'm just thinking like, Jay, she's got to be doing stuff that Jade does. Like, again, they were raised in the same household. They have the same genetics, you know, makeup. Like, there's just tendencies that tend to happen. Phrases you use, all that kind of stuff. It's got to be hitting Will the same way, you know? Hi, my name is Emily, and I've been unpacking this for a week. And we'll continue to go unpack it until the show gives me these two talking about their feelings. <laughs> Let them have their weird little family that makes sense for them and everybody needs to stop trying to force them into being a couple. Let them be platonic life partners. Yeah. And you know what? It's 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 not weird even. It's family loving each other. It's just what it is. I totally yeah. agree. I totally agree. I just mean to uh, other people yeah, seem to be treating it as if it is exactly. weird. And I'm like, no. Exactly. All right, let's let's uh I got I got a couple I got one big thing I need to talk about in the old mode crashing. Do we got before we move on to crash in the mode? We got anything from Neil that? We oh yeah, yeah. Oh shoot, anything sorry. Um, yeah, a whole episode of sixteens. <laughs> Take sixteen, episode sixteen. Blah 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 blah. All I could think of was Neil the whole time. Uh, yeah, Neil says I love Guy because of how little people love Guy. <laughs> he remains helpful and relevant. Neil says, "No, he's a garbage fire." I just I, he's, he's a he's garbage man. I, I I I like Guy from a storytelling standpoint. I like Guy as a as a point of reference for other characters. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I would not ever want to meet or interact with Guy. Never. Ever. No. But he's fun and He's stories. all those internet guys in in live it's action. Like, it's, it's like how I had that. Re I was telling you guys how the second Captain Boomerang showed up and like started making comments at Halo. I was like, okay, I viscerally hate you as a person. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's like you're an interesting character to be around but i despise right. you uh neil says halo's love for breakfast burritos made me feel seen more than maybe any other line in the entire show <laughs> that was nice uh he points out that beast boy had to stay in that gorilla he couldn't change out of that gorilla form like one because he had to yeah. like keep that guy pinned but also his clothes totally ripped off he had no clothes <laughs> on he was not in costume he just had to walk through uh, L.A. as a gorilla. Right. Um, no, he could he could have switched into another animal yeah, later. Maybe. Yeah, but uh, Neil said uh, I was not at all prepared for full granny, full granny goodness, man. Oh, the scene that brings that brings up something I wanted to say was just the moment where Beast Boy stands up and just looks her in the face and says, "Bring it." Every time I see that, I'm just like, "Oh man, yes." Gar is like becoming, he's becoming, this is what the show is about that really makes me happy is, is that I didn't do enough of when I was a teenager, which is becoming who you need to be, like allowing yourself to be who you are. And Gar is like, I'm done with you. I am done with you. And I have the skills, the friends and the abilities to be able to do what needs to get done. Oh my gosh. Neil said he loves the white stealth suits and the new Suicide Squad makes sense. Of his, what was he calling them? The leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> Mala and Black Manta and Boomerang. Yeah, we were, I, I was, he, he says here, I'm still kind of surprised that Waller didn't yet know about the team. And I, I, I was also surprised about that, but I was actually kind of happy about it because we're kind of seeing, because Waller was the, was the warden and now she's the Waller that we know from the comics. But she's still yeah. becoming that Waller, which is kind of cool to me. Like she's becoming this this force of nature that she becomes in the comics, right? Um, and that she's still f discovering things. I actually really like that a lot. Because despite terrors, we never get any confirmation that anybody in the prison ever knew that Superboy and Miss Martian were there. They right. talk about how they explicitly didn't tell anybody yeah, in charge. Yeah. 
<laughs> he said he said Bruce Lee is going to get all going to get jacked up from all those table scraps. And uh, his last comment is, "Oh, devastation in Simon, the gift that keeps on giving." <laughs> The bafflement that continues. I love all of it. Uh, and I'm I'm looking forward to his uh, recording every 16 that he finds, because I am still finding them. There are more 16s, I think, in these three episodes than I've seen in a while. <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. This week, we have a new five-star review. This one from Dick Chespedesi. Overwhelmingly good. This podcast dedicated to Young Justice is the perfect companion to the TV show. The hosts are all very well-spoken and charismatic, but most importantly, their love of the source material is infectious. They will do deep dives into characters as well as showcase the writing and plotting of each episode. The hosts then use the show to give advice on how to make your creative ventures better than you thought they could ever be. Finally, their fan showcase is amazing and helps you feel connected to all the wonderful people that love this show as much as you do. Subscribe now. You will not be disappointed. We also wanted to welcome our newest Patreon member, Jessica Compton. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome to Gamma Squad. If you haven't had a chance to check out the Protean City Comics podcast that we talked about in a recent fan service, today is the day. Link over to Protean City Comics on your favorite podcatcher for the return of Emily's character, Highwire, in a three-part arc airing today and continuing the next two Wednesdays. We'll have a link in the show notes. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. Uh, This Crashing the Mode, of course, would be based on episodes 1 through 16, if you're listening to this in the future. Hairbrush? Still don't know what's going on. She's looking, I mean, she's looking at that. It's a weird thing for her to look at a piece of hair under a microscope. Like, that's not how you check genetics. So like that's not how that's you not science. how that's not how science is. That's not how you science. That's that's sophomore year biology class. Right, right. Yeah, and the the DNA is housed in the thing at the base of the hair and you got to get that off and then you got to spin it down and do all that kind of stuff. And that's great, but I mean I don't expect him to go into that much detail, but still like just looking something under a microscope and having that look on her face, who knows what it is that she's doing. Oh, it, it was this you that put this watch watchman thing in or was that Neil? Yes. That was I forgot to mention that earlier. Lex Luthor casually mentions in that way that Lex Luthor does that he's like, this is why we have a satellite around the watchtower to make sure that the Justice League isn't doing anything bad. And he has the line, so we watch the watchtower, but who watches the watchmen? And I'm like, are are we going there? Mm-hmm. Are we going down this path? Or is this just an Easter egg reference to Watchmen? Because I, I really hope it's just an Easter egg reference. I don't need to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is that like before the Watchmen, before the Watchmen comic came out, I'm not, I don't yeah. think this was translated quite that way. It's Kis Custodia et Ipsos Custodis. And it's, uh, the, it's who watches the Watchmen but it's not always translated that way. It's like... What are you talking about translated? It's the original phrase, who watches the Watchmen, is actually a Latin phrase. Quis okay. custodiet ipsos custodes, which is, which is who cares for the custodians, is almost like how I understand that it's translated as. And there's another... Trans- I'm trying to figure out if I can find the translation, because it... Who will guard the guards is one of the things that they say like who who guards the guard the guards themselves is basically the the translation that I remember hearing before Watchmen came out and then this is also kind of a you know quote unquote legal you know translation and it makes sense um but he's using that I mean they uses that specific one obviously and he's clearly using it yeah. to reference the DC stuff and if you want to hear some mind blowing stuff go listen to Jeff Stormer Talk about how the Watchmen even came about in the first place. In <laughs> it was in the second uh, interview with him. You can go back to um, our reprint episodes that we uh, that we aired over the winter during the winter break, the holiday break. Um, listen to his second one where we're talking about Blue Beetle, but he goes into details about the where this came from and are they going to do? I don't know. I I I can't I can't imagine if we got more seasons that they would get into. The Watchmen. I mean, I don't know what they would do with that. 
No one in the Watchmen has any teen sidekicks. We can't do it. <laughs> that's true. Joking, well, no, but... I was thinking about it. I'm like, that's true. Silk Spectre was not. She was the Black Canary equivalent, and her mom was. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway. I don't but know. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I think it's just a nice little Easter egg, and we're not going to get anywhere near that chaos. Is Beast Boy setting up the Titans? I don't know. I think he's setting up the Titans. I think he is setting up <laughs> a public facing inspirational group of teenagers and he's going to do the Titans. So the team is going to be its own thing and Beast Boy and Impulse and Blue Beetle are going to make up the new Titans. And if that's the case, they have done a really they've they've have really spent some time with Vic not wanting to join the team. And if that's the case, and some, they manage to flip this around where he decides he wants to do something, and now Vic joins the public-facing Titans instead, instead of being a covert ops dude, which would be tough for him because of the way that his, you know, his uh, cybernetics are on the outside of his body, like, he could join the Titans. And then that would also give us an opening to bring in Starfire and Raven by the end of the season. <laughs> And now you've got all you need is all you need is it's like excuses to bring in everyone. All you need is because because Tim is probably going to go from Robin to to Red Robin, and now you've got the <laughs> Titans. Like this is not a giant leap, and the whole thing about the Titans too was about insp- inspiring people, right? Inspiring teens, and Beast Boy is leaning hard into this over episode after episode, and he's not looking at the fifty two million likes or whatever. Because he wants that attention, he's looking at it and saying, like, this, 52 million teenagers looked at this. 52 million people looked at this and and saw a, a metahuman helping someone else. That's what he's thinking. I know that's what he's thinking. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That would be so great. I agree. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. And they're, like, they're all over the galaxy now, which means they could run into Tamarin, which is the Starfire's home world, and that could get pulled in pretty easily. I don't know. I got a whole thing going on. I also think it, with that, this isn't even crashing the mode, I just think it's interesting who decided that Beast Boy was right and who didn't. Like, the fact that you got Static and Tracy who were like, nah, nah let's not do this, and you have... Blue Beetle and Impulse, uh, not Impulse, Kid Flash. I think I said Impulse. We're too. like, yeah, because because we're so used to it. We're like, oh yes, Kid Flash, Wally. But yeah, we're, I just think that's really interesting. And I mean, Blue was Blue's a public figure by accident, yes, <laughs> right. So people know who he is. So the fact that he's still on the team as a covert ops member is in, is interesting. But still, like, he makes sense. And the former Kid Flash was public, so it it all makes sense to me. I just yeah. think it's interesting. And I forgot to write this down in Crashing the Mode, but if we have a few seconds, can we talk about what's up with Tara for a second? With Tara? Tara, Tara. Yeah. Tara, Tara. Because, so it's just weird to me for a show that kept us guessing for 26 episodes over who the mole was back in season one, but is showing us... Tara doing suspicious things and making it very clear that that's absolutely what she's doing. We don't just get a a shot of Tara like chilling outside listening to this conversation. We see her record it and we see it be sent to Deathstroke. So I'm like, what, what, what's going on here? Because I feel like there's another level somewhere that we don't understand yet. I, I am I am absolutely convinced it's Macomb. I'm still absolutely convinced. I get more and more convinced. Every scene that I see her use powers and somebody explains why McGann specifically is not there on the team <laughs> that meant that mission, I'm just like, oh, really? I'm not saying Tara's Macomb. I'm just saying you've never seen Tara and Macomb in the same place at the same time. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, one time where Superboy was like, well, this is why we've got the, you know, the bio ship and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, that's the thing. He did it again. They did it again. <laughs> I'm just like. I I feel like we also had some conversation or you mentioned to me that you had a conversation with somebody who thinks that they're doing like a double, triple cross situation. Yeah, or like that. that's right. Uh, Gosh. 
uh, once again, somebody who had, who had emailed us, let me see if I can find it. And it mentioned something about, a uh, like that they know that Tara is a potential mole. They brought her onto the team to give kind of false information or to like keep an eye on her, which is also yeah. an interesting possibility. Let me give credit where I can. I'm so sorry for people who, that we get flooded with stuff and I, I, I lose track of who sent one and I'm so sorry. I feel terrible. Oh, it was Jacob again. All right. Uh, so Jacob was the one I mentioned earlier who brought up um, Angel and the Ape. I forgot we had had a conversation. Hi, Jacob. Double, double, double call out this week. Um, yeah, which is a possibility as well. And he brought it up because Calder specifically is like, how about Tara? And Artemis is like, we can all hear you. And Calder's like, I know. And it's like, hmm, that's why. Why would you say that? Why would you say you're on speakerphone when you've never felt like you needed to say that in the past? Uh, and it's so that's like, an interesting think, observation. And at the same time, I think it does read subtle enough that like the first time I watched that, I was like, oh, she's just saying, I don't want to give a team progress report in front of the team. Well, and Young Justice does a really good job of double meanings to everything that's being said. Absolutely. You know? I flash back to, Aqu- to Aqualad saying, perfect. <laughs> All through <laughs> season two. <laughs> Where he, when he really means he's like, ugh, not again. I have to deal with this. It's yes, fine. Exactly. All right. Let's, uh, unless you have, do you have anything else to wrap up? Otherwise, let's, uh, it's fine. I'll be over here screaming for the next <laughs> week, but it's fine. Everything's fine. All right. Our next scream something hopefully will be after just another couple of episodes and, uh, we'll, we'll get that out and then, uh, look forward to some discussion sessions and some other things that we have planned in the intervening weeks. All right. And with all that, I think we can Zeta out of the watchtower. Thank you all for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well